We'll call the meeting of public safety and security policy and finance to order. We'll start with the roll call. Johnson. Here. Lomer. Hillstrom. Here. Beckerfin. Here. Considine. Here. Dean. Here. Frankie. Here. Grossel. Here. Howe. Lucero. Here. Newberger. Here. O'Neill. Here. Pinto. Here. Uglum. Here. Ward. Here. Zerwa. Here. Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, I am uh, starting off the committee with a bit of a concern. Um, last week, we had a couple of bills that were heard, um, one by Representative Frankie, in which people brought in signs and pictures of folks who had died uh, in crashes that uh, involved hands-free devices. And as we sat here, members of the audience had uh, large placards, large photographs um, of their loved ones. Um, today, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, folks tried to bring in signs and those signs were being collected at the door. And so, Mr. Chair, I would like this committee to have a rule based on signs, not based on whether or not you agree with what's on the sign, but whether or not signs are appropriate in a committee room. So, Mr. Chair, given that uh, previous signs were permitted in this <coughs> committee hearing, um, until we get a, a rule about um, signs, I would like people to be able to um, have their signs as long as they use them in a respectful manner um, as they were permitted last week. Uh, Representative Hillstrom, um, as, as we talked a little earlier, I was first time I heard about it was when I walked in here today. I had, I personally had nothing to do with that. Um, I will be glad even after this meeting today, see if we can get to sit down together and come up with a rule that we both can agree on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like it to not be content-based and based on whatever rules um, are good, whether we like the bill or not. I, I also agree. That's why I wish to work it out with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Zerwaz, have you had an opportunity to uh, review the minutes? Yeah, but I'd like to move the minutes, please. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 That is approved. They were going to start out with uh, Representative David's bill, House File 3249, and the chair move to re-refer to the general register. Representative Davis, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And there's an author's amendment, the H3249A1 amendment. If someone would be so kind as to move that. Uh, the chair and what, what the amendment does, Mr. Chairman, is uh, we had an oversight. We had not included tow trucks, and I, it was my intention to have tow trucks included as long as they have the proper lights and everything. So this would add tow trucks. Uh, the uh, chair will move the A1 amendment. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We'll move to uh, Representative Davis. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, this is, uh, bill has been uh, named the move over bill. Uh, in current statute, if you're on a four lane and there's emergency vehicle, uh, you are to move over into the lane furthest away from that emergency vehicle for obvious reasons for public safety. Uh, Minnesota has no law uh, on a two lane. Now, some states surrounding us uh, have laws concerning that and, and this is, well, this is basically patterned after the Wisconsin uh, statute. Um, I was visiting with a friend of mine uh, one evening, uh, Mr. Scott Knight, and uh, he's a lineman uh, for XL Energy. And he got to, we got to visiting about how dangerous it can be uh, for line workers uh, alongside uh, a highway, a two lane highway. And so I said, you know, there ought to be a law. And I thought, now who could do something like that? And I thought, well, I can do that. Uh, and so he said, you need to talk to a gentleman named Kellen Schmidt, uh, who has been uh, working on this issue for some time. So we set up a meeting. I met with uh, uh, Mr. Knight and Mr. Schmidt, uh, and we put some ideas together. And a result of that is what you have before you. 
Uh, it's been quite interesting. If you met with your electric co-ops recently, uh, this is their number one agenda item. And because they're in the same situation uh, that the XL uh, line workers are. So I have with me today, Mr. Kellenstra, I know you're pressed for time. Uh, he's here as a resource if there's questions uh, that the committee would have. And so basically what we're doing is we're saying that if you're on a two lane uh, and you can, you, you have to slow down and you might have to even stop. Uh, and it's just a matter of safety. These, these, there's times when these line workers can't get their rigs totally and completely off to the side. There's just not room. Uh, and so uh, what this would do is this would, uh, like I said, mirror Wisconsin law saying that uh, you have to slow down. Uh, and if you can't go out in the other lane safely, then you should stop uh, until it's safe to proceed. So that's very simply what it does. Like I said, it's the number one agenda item for the electric co-ops, uh, but it was brought to me by uh, Excel Energy uh, Lineman, and uh, it's a very simple bill, and I think it would uh, uh, be very beneficial to uh, protecting linemen as they're working on the highways. Uh, Representative Dean. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the bill author, I'm, I'm looking at uh, the uh, subdivision 12 and section two, and I'm looking at line 2.33, and then on the next page, line 3.4, and it says a stop freeway service patrol vehicle. Now, I'm assuming that might be a state highway patrol vehicle. So does this then apply directly to uh, local police as well in those current situations? Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question, uh, Representative Dean. Um, maybe staff can help me out. I think a service patrol vehicle, would that be like a highway helper? I don't think that's state patrol or law enforcement. Um, <clears throat> maybe. I, it could be the... Uh, thinking it could be the first or could actually be the commercial vehicle inspectors. They are not state patrol, but they drive a state patrol vehicle with yellow lights. Okay, just, just asking for clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative. Any, any public testimony? Okay, with that, this Chair moves House file 3249 to be re-referred to the general register as amended. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? You're on your way to the general register. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any Thank final you, members. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Representative Lomer with House File 3551. Representative Lover, do you wish to move your bill to the general register? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House File 3551 to the general register. And good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Thanks uh, for hearing our bill today. So House File 3551 is the Safe at Home Administration Bill. Safe at Home is an address confidentiality program administered by the Office of Secretary of State. Safe at Home was created in 2006 to protect victims of stalking, domestic violence, sexual assault, and others who fear for their safety. Minnesota is one of over 30 states with similar programs. Minnesota's Safe at Home program currently serves over 2,600 individuals representing over 1,000 households. The program works by giving participants a legal substitute address, a post office box, to use in place of their physical address. And this address can be used whenever an address is required. As the Safe at Home program passed the 10-year mark, the program is proposing an administration bill that would address issues that have come up over the lifetime of the program. This is a technical bill that has resulted from years of feedback from those interacting with the Safe at Home program and is intended to provide more clarity and transparency to the program. So Secretary of State Steve Simon is here, and he can walk the members through the bill and answer any questions. Secretary Simon, it's a pleasure to have you back in this committee. It's uh, been Thank a you, couple Mr. years. 
Um, please introduce yourself and continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. It's an honor to be here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your uh, uh, leadership on this issue. We had some good meetings and discussions during the interim about this bill as as we did with many legislators on this committee. I want to thank Representative Lomer for her leadership. She was very quick to take up the challenge and the cause here and I know many of you have supported this over the years. Uh, as Representative Lomer stated, um, this is an administration bill. We're not making large policy changes here but they're really clarifying changes based on years of input and feedback. I ironically in past years this program has asked <coughs> for policy changes. This isn't that. This is a pretty basic technical bill and Mr. Chair we shopped this past you, your counterpart in the Senate, uh, many members in this room all along saying if anyone thought that if anything in this bill was controversial, ought to be stripped out, ought to run on its own, we would do that. No one has said that. So we think we're fairing in saying that these are technical changes. I won't go line by line. You've got a lot to cover today. Uh, I will just touch on the highlights and, and then stand for questions or comments. Uh, first part of the bill adds a requirement that the participants provide our office with a date of birth on the application. This is private data. Uh, in our hands. It's just a way to distinguish among various participants. We're now getting large enough so that there are multiple people with the same name. And when you have or two or three Jennifer Andersons, you want to know which one is the one born in a certain year or on a certain date. That's important for making sure we get the records correct. Uh, the second major provision clarifies that the program is not that, that participation in the program, enrollment in the program, is not evidence of anything other than enrollment in the program. It can't be used as a sword in any legal proceeding. It is not proof of any underlying allegation that might lead someone to believe they belong in the program. Proof of en enrollment is just that, proof of enrollment and nothing more in a court of law. Uh, the third clarification is that uh, as a clarification of when a participant must inform our office if they have a change in their personal information, they have to inform us of a change of their legal name, address, or their telephone number. Those are our basic um, criteria for enrollment and it stands to reason that they should tell us if those things change. Um, the fourth I would single out for you is a clarification that a participant may only have one substitute address and all mail must be sent to uh, them using that substitute address. Once in a while we get people who inadvertently or otherwise try to deviate from that protocol. We want to make clear and that's a founding principle of the program. They've got to use that substitute address. And then finally I would just uh, uh, call to your attention the provision that allows our office to share the substitute address, not the real address. That's the whole idea of the program. The real address is secret. But we could share the substitute address uh, and that that address is designed to be, to be public for all purposes, public and private. It's a P.O. box. It's the same for anyone in Minnesota, whether you live in Minneapolis or Thief River Falls, it's that same P.O. box. It's just a different lot number. That's how we distinguish among various participants. So we believe these changes, although minor, will improve the administration of the program and will benefit both the participants and the entities that interact with those program participants. That's really it. It's a technical bill. Happy to stand for questions or comments. Representative becker -Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just wanted to thank Representative Lomer and Secretary Simon. Uh, this is a program that's used by uh, victims of domestic violence that, that I work with, and sometimes it's, it's the difference between applying for an order for protection or applying for different benefits. And so I just want to thank everyone who supported this program over the years. It definitely is necessary and uh, very important to the folks who use it. So thank you for bringing this forward. Happy to support it. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and members and, and Representative becker Finn, thank you. We're, we're quite confident that this program has saved lives. There's really no question about that. So thank you all of you for your strong support over many years. Anybody from the audience wish to testify? With that, Representative Lomer, do you wish to uh, renew your motion? Yes, I do, Mr. Chair. I'll renew my motion that House File 3551 and I don't know where it's General going. Register. Be passed and sent to the General Register. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Chair, Chair members. members. Thank, Thank you. you. Secretary Simon. <coughs> Next, we have House File 3076, Representative Sandstein. Good morning, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, this is my first time in front of you, so snacks are coming. <laughs> Um, before you, you should have file 3076. Um, first of all, I would like to move the uh, House file 3076 to be re referred to the General Register. Thank you. House file 3076 is the St. Louis County um, 
Civil Service Commission bill. This is a bill that is really just updating very obsolete language. We heard this bill in government ops and at that point it was passed to the general register at which point we became aware there is, there is a provision that should have gone before your committee. So it is before you today to talk about that. With me today I have Jim Gottschild and he will um, be happy to explain the provision and answer any questions you have. Uh, go ahead and you're talking about the, the provision of 17.2. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Jim Gottschall, Director of Human Resources for St. Louis County. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak in support of uh, uh, House File 3076. Uh, the bill proposes technical updates to modernize our civil service employment system that was originally passed back in 1941. The proposed updates uh, include deletion of transition language, removing obsolete language, and a very small number of substantive changes, including uh, Section 33C055, uh, which is the penalty, and that's found on line 17.5. Uh, specifically, it's a reduction from a gross misdemeanor to a misdemeanor for violation of provisions of the Civil Service Employment Statute for St. Louis County. Our county is one of five counties in the state of Minnesota that has an employment law that's specifically written for our county. So it's our belief that uh, proposed changes would not impact any other local units of government in Minnesota. St. Louis County researched uh, similarly situated city, county, state, municipalities in Minnesota and could not identify any other that had a gross misdemeanor listed as a penalty for violations of the employment law. Uh, we also researched uh, going back to 1943 when our Civil Service Commission uh, took effect, uh, we identified no one that was ever charged under this uh, penalty clause and believe that, uh, you know, just based on the, uh, the level of penalty for this type of employment act, it would be more consistent to reduce it to a misdemeanor and that would be more consistent with other uh, jurisdictions. Thank you. Is there any questions? Any public testimony on this bill? Okay, then I will uh, renew my motion to send House File 3076 uh, and re refer it to the General Register. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, oh, boy. Thank you. Next is uh, House File 1719. Representative Whalen. Good morning, Representative Whalen. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, House, uh, the chair is going to uh, move. Uh, I would uh, hear this bill 1719 to uh, lay over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present the bill before you today. Uh, the bill is the result of a lot of collaboration. When I originally introduced the bill, I was thinking it would just be a simple change and found very quickly, I don't think there is such a thing within the realm of family law. It's an incredibly complex area of our statutes. And so um, I do wanna thank some folks that have worked on the bill with me. Um, Melinda Hugdahl and Legal Aid are here to share um, some specifics and help answer questions. And I have a constituent here that will share uh, why we're hearing this bill as well because I was, it was brought to my attention that we have a conflict in our statutes right now regarding when someone can bring uh, a challenge to a recognition of paternity statute. And basically, um, right now in law, if you are um, currently uh, married and a child is born and you believe that you are the father and you sign uh, the declaration of paternity, if you find later that you might not be uh, the biological father, you have two years to bring an action but no more than three years after the child is born. However, there's another part in our statute that, say, that states if you are the presumed father and another man has a presumption of paternity, then to declare non-existence, you have six months to bring a case if you have genetic testing showing that you're not the presumed father. So my constituent fell into both categories. Um, however, the child was not, was past the age of three. And so 
there were very few lawyers. In fact, he had an incredible challenge trying to find a lawyer to take this case. When I brought up this uh, issue with legal aid, they uh, really took on the issue. We, we made the bill better. We, had, we added a few things um, regarding factors that the court must consider when they are trying to decide some of these cases. Uh, the bill establishes that the petitioner must show by clear and convincing evidence uh, that declaring the non-existence of the father-child relationship is in the best interest of the child. Um, previously, there was not a lot of direction for the courts in determining these cases, and so we believe those factors are going to be very helpful. And with that, members, as I, um, as yeah. I want to allow my constituent the time to share what happened with uh, him and his story, I will say I'm happy to answer questions, but would like to simply hand it over to him uh, to share. Welcome to the committee. You can introduce yourself for, for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair Committee. My name is Benjamin Edward Barrett. Um, basically, I uh, came upon this as um, I, I was in love with a woman, as we all have been. Uh, had a child, thought it was mine, biologically mine, no doubt in my mind, no doubt in her mind. Uh, got married after the fact, a few years down the road, just had a family together, so we thought might as well get married at this point. Um, biological dad came back from the military, decided that he wanted to have a paternity test after we were already married. Um, <clears throat> and uh, at this point found out that his paternity test came back positive that he was biological father. Um, at that point we were already married, wanted to continue, try to make our family work, try the best as possible. Um, it was a very hard thing to deal with at the time being as I was Obviously, I had felt that I was the father. Very difficult thing to do, very emotional time for me. Um, ended up getting divorced a few years down the road from her, from that, and came up with this in court. Um, because of the two different statutes, it was very difficult for me to uh, try and get my name removed at that time. They said I was gonna have to come back with a lawyer at a previous date, possibly to figure out everything from there. Um, Took me probably about three to four years after that to actually find a lawyer just because of the confusion, the, the problems, and nobody really would just want to take it. Um, so I really, uh, I, I'm, I found, finally found a lawyer today that will, it has some, found some issues that we're trying to fight for to get everything worked out. Um, but that's where we put it on. I'm free to answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you again. You, uh, Representative Will, do you have any other testifiers? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have Melinda Hogdell here from Legal Aid to just speak to some of the technical aspects of the bill, if the committee would like uh, to hear her walk through the bill. Any questions from the committee? Is there uh, anyone from the audience public that wishes to testify. How much is it going to cost him to fight that wall? First timer. <laughs> okay. All those, I will uh, renew my motion to lay the bill over for possible inclusion. Pardon me, Thank you. Oh. How much is it going to cost him for the legal fees to battle a bad law? Uh, at this time, you're out of order. We've already. Uh, I'm sorry. Moved the bill. I, I, I apologize. Okay. What is the procedure for next time I want to ask? A uh, when we ask for public testimony, that is the time to do that. I you spoke, but you couldn't hear him. Okay. 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 Representative Whalen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, regarding the just a, a final closing comment. Uh, this statute, if it were to become law, the change we're making, um, actually won't technically help my constituent right now. But he is bringing this forward and he's here to testify because he doesn't want people to find themselves in the same situation. And so um, while I'm hoping the, the lawyer that fin he did finally take or find to take the case will be able to help him, uh, the change we're making is, t is starting, it would be um, for cases that c come and wouldn't actually impact uh, his case. but. He does want to help others uh, avoid the same situation. So with that, Mr. Chair, I thank you and members of the committee for your consideration and uh, would appreciate your support. 
But I thank you for bringing this issue forward, and I thank you for what you're doing. Next, we have House File 2766, for Representative Wills. Representative Wills here. Representative Whalen. Well, we are looking for uh, Representative Wills. I believe he's in another committee as well at this time. Would you be willing to start out on, uh, since you're one of the co-authors? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I am not prepared to make any remarks on this. I believe but... Representative Zerwaz will give you a hand. It's uh, 2766. It's the DWI. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I will confess that I don't believe I'm an expert on this, but uh, also I just wanted to clarify, uh, I was just chatting with uh, some of the folks that were working with me on the previous bill that it was laid over. There was That is okay, laid over. Making sure. Um, so my, um, the reason that I co-authored this bill uh, that is before you today is that there's actually um, a member from my church came to me and said that there was a, a good friend of theirs passed away uh, because of some intoxicating substances that um, were uh, in, I believe, in a, um, in a car situation. And right now our statutes don't regulate that. And so this bill, my understanding, um, is to address those issues and help ensure that when we're defining intoxicating substance, it includes those specific substances that led to the death of um, that good friend of hers. And so I found out that Representative Wills is actually the representative. Um, Here's your list of testifiers. Uh, representative Wills is actually the um, representative of the family like in the community that was in the community where it happened. And so she had been approached previously and I said I believe it's a, a good bill and would like to co-author. With that, I don't have much more to share as far as my involvement with this bill, Mr. Chair, but there are um, some testifiers here and I'm um, there, there, there's happy all, to answer any questions from members. There's also the A1 amendment. Um, uh, amendment number is uh, the A1. Um, the chair will move the A1 amendment. All those in favor or say aye. 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 This will be getting the author, the intent of the author expired, and I guess we will start with the first uh, testifier. I believe it's uh, Clay Ken Kendhammer. I wonder if. What about uh, well, I think is uh, David Bernstein here? I have a feeling they're in another committee at this time. Uh, Lieutenant Don Morrows. Yeah. There we go. Morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, Could you please state your name for the record and uh, continue? Don Morrows. That's M A R O S D. Uh, and I'm just here to, today to uh, just quickly to say that this 
uh, bill is going to go a long way to assist law enforcement in removing impaired drivers from our road. Um, currently we have what I would describe as a loophole in the law that uh, does not allow for some enforcement and prosecution of some drivers who are impaired uh, on things that don't currently fit the definition of the law and this would go a long way in helping uh, kind of close that loophole or, or at least give us more tools in the toolbox to assist in uh, removing those impaired drivers. Thank you. And the uh, representative Wills is now here to finish. <laughs> Uh, uh, for the committee, just as well, the chair is going to move to lay the bill over for possible inclusion. And we've, we've already attached your, uh, the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I apologize. I was um, presenting a bill in tax committee and came right down. <laughs> so I know uh, my legislative assistant is making sure that the rest of the testifiers can get down here for the hearing. And um, you already gave your testimony. Thank you. So this bill um, was brought to me by a constituent, um, House File 2766. And uh, the constituent is expected to be here to testify today. Uh, his name is Clay, and he'll tell his story. Um, but uh, what happened in light of the situation that happened uh, with his brother and his brother's friends passing away um, with a car accident that happened in Wisconsin and brought about a court case here in Minnesota. And we realized that if the accident had happened here in Minnesota, there would have been no way to prosecute uh, under our current DWI law. And so we've been working with um, the DWI task force and several other stakeholders to craft the language and make sure that it um, addresses that situation. And uh, what's currently <coughs> in our state law is the OSHA list for hazardous substances. And uh, the reason we decided to go away from the OSHA list is because a few different reasons. One of them is currently it's an itemized list. And as new chemicals or substances are being discovered, um, they may not be on that list. And uh, the reason we didn't want to just add a difluoroethane, which is the substance found um, that is not on the list, to just add that would mean adding uh, any future chemicals through the legislative process, and that can be a cumbersome process. And so we wanted to uh, do a, a broad change that would allow us to address these situations without having to come back to the legislature multiple times. Uh, so changing the language to intoxicating substance that impairs the central nervous system or impairs the human audio, visual, or mental processes uh, addresses it in a more comprehensive way and helps out our law enforcement and prosecutors when they're dealing with these cases. So another reason that uh, we wanted to go away from the OSHA standard is because it doesn't deal with driving and with the DWI um, situations. It actually deals with uh, labor and workforce situations. So it wasn't um, the most accurate or applicable uh, method uh, to begin with. So um, you have in your packets at least you should have several letters of support uh, for the bill from the DWI task force, um, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association, Minnesota State Patrol Troopers Association, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Minnesotans for Safe Driving, the Department of Labor and Industry, the South Lake Minnetonka Police Department, and the Household and Commercial Products Association. So there's several stakeholders who have been involved in the crafting of this language and are very familiar with these types of situations and are in full support of this bill. So with that, uh, I would be happy to have any additional testifiers present their testimony at this time or answer questions. 
have your uh, testifiers uh, arrived yet? I don't know if they have any in the audience. Please introduce yourself to the record and continue. Well, Mr. Chair, my name is Jeff Tate. I am the Chief of Police for the City of Shockby. I'm a proud participant in the state's DWI task force and a director with the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. I'd like to express our Chiefs of Police Association support for House File 2766. As you heard, a loophole currently exists. Not all substances that impair driving are recognized the same under current law. Consequently, not all impaired drivers are treated the same. This proposed legislation fixes that loophole and would keep us from coming back year after year to add additional substance, substances to the list. OSHA's list of hazardous substances is too small and hasn't been effective. Regardless of how impaired someone might be, we can't charge unless it's on the list. For example, someone could be on dust off glues or bath salts and maybe show much more higher signs of impairment than someone who is a 0.08, yet the punishment is not the same. Striking references to hazardous substances or OSHA's list in general is an important step forward. These substances are tough to deal with. Synthetics are always evolving and are often available just by simply clicking one's keyboard. We're always playing catch up on these substances. Change one molecule and it comes off the list. The burden is still on us to prove that someone drove impaired and what impaired them. I think it's important to remember that this is not just about punishment, but this proposal will also help individuals uh, get greater access to valuable court services, including education, monitoring, and treatment. So the Minnesota Chiefs of Police uh, Association again supports this bill because it closes a current loophole in the law, improves public safety on our roads, and provides better opportunities for intervention and treatment. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead with your next testifier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to introduce Clay, who um, is the constituent who brought this situation to Senator Greg Claussen and myself to get this addressed. Welcome to the committee, and if you could play, please state your name for the record and continue. Uh, my name is Clay Kent Hammer. Um, thank you for. Uh, allowing me to testify. I apologize for being a little late. I think I misread the email. But um, on July 13th, 2017, Brian Riddell, Jeremy Bircham, and Adam Kenhammer, my little brother, died in a ditch along I-494, excuse me, I-94, in Wisconsin, about 40 miles from the Minnesota border. The personal belongings they had packed for a weekend at a cabin were scattered along the road. The car that they were riding in was unrecognizable and burning as people drove by and stared. Brian was so badly disfigured that his mother never even got to look at him again. They were spared no dignity. This is the reality of my brother's death. They were killed when my brother's car was hit head on by someone driving the wrong side of I-94 shortly before 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. The driver of the other vehicle, who of course survived, was found to have multiple spent cans of Ultra Duster in his vehicle, which he had huffed to get high from a chemical known as DFE. In Wisconsin, DFE is considered an intoxicant. Operating a vehicle with DFE in your system is covered under the state's DWI laws. That's not the case in Minnesota. Had this happened 40 miles to the west, the driver would have been charged with careless driving. The bill that is being presented is designed to correct this. When this bill was introduced and presented to the Senate committee, the dissenting view was given by a representative of the Defense Attorney Association. His hypothetical concern was that the law might be used unfairly to prosecute the innocent, specifically someone who had drank a can of Diet Coke and now had caffeine in their system. That seems like a plausible argument. All you would need is an officer who thought it was his job to look for caffeine users, a prosecutor who would go along with it, a judge who would allow it, and the abolition of the appeals process. My brother's killer was found at the scene, in the vehicle. There were scores of eyewitnesses. He had a history of impaired driving, no license or insurance. After a search warrant was granted by a judge, his blood was tested and he was found to have DFE in his system. 
And yet this open and shut case remains unresolved because this type of conviction being sought is just not that easy to get. Maybe caffeine concerns are not all that plausible and maybe that wasn't really the reason they were objecting to the law, but like I said, it was hypothetical. My experience is based on reality. And the reality is that law enforcement is in a race against the world trying to keep up, keep pace with the different substances that people are using to reach a longer, more intense, and cheaper high. Failure to act now will lead us right back here, trying to play catch up as each new substance gains popularity and leave lawmakers trying to explain to another victim's family why they're being denied justice. Thank you. Thank you. Any other testifiers? I don't know if we have any more in the audience or if they're still on their way down. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, I'm Nancy Johnson. I represent Minnesotans for Safe Driving. We believe it's imperative that every driver is not impaired by any substance. Unfortunately, every year there are multiple new intoxicating substances being developed illegally for the purpose of getting high and that are not on any list and are not defined as a controlled substance. Plus, there's everyday substances that can be used to get high that are made for other reasons, such as dust off, compressed air, bath, oil, bath salts, gasoline, paint. If a substance is not listed as a part of the law, the driver cannot be charged with a DWI and may continue to use it because they cannot be prosecuted and treatment cannot be mandated. It would be difficult and dangerous to wait for legislation sessions to add new substances every year while the substances out there are causing crashes and fatalities. A stop for DWI has been a wake-up call for many drivers that haven't had to face their addiction or what they might consider themselves impaired. A bill, th this bill eliminates the hazardous substance listing. That is a list made up for protecting the employee from the dangers of hazardous substances that can cause uh, health issues to the employee, but is not appropriate for the types of substances that cause impairment on the highway. Instead, the term intoxicating substances with a new definition will take its place and cover the array of substances that are now and ones that will be developed. We do not want anyone on our roads or behind a snowmobile, a uh, recreational vehicle, a boat under uh, influence of any intoxicating substances. So we really want this passed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think. You're absolutely right. This needs to be done. I do, and we need to tighten this up. I do have some concerns, and maybe you can work on this. Maybe you've already had this discussion, but I'm a little concerned about taking out the knowingly, and that's my only concern is, is that someone may be exposed to a chemical either at work as a firefighter or, a, or someone that works in a plant and may not ab actually know that they're <clears throat> impaired on a substance, even though I know that that's still wrong. I'm just a little bit concerned about casting a wide net. Maybe you've already had this discussion. Uh, that's the only thing that strikes me is when we struck the word knowingly throughout the, the uh, statute. So uh, you can, if you can speak to that and maybe ease some concerns. Representative Wills. And thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Howe. And I appreciate that. It's, it's a very valid question and something that was addressed in the Senate hearing as well. And uh, while I understand the concern, this is something that uh, I spoke with the folks on the DWI task force uh, and several prosecutors. And uh, the reason why we want to strike the word knowingly is because uh, it, it's basically impossible to prove that someone knowingly um, consumed a, a product. Um, and there's already, uh, a self-defense option where you can prove involuntary intoxication. Um, so that is available to someone if they feel that they didn't know, um, that they weren't aware that that was going to affect them that way. Um, so there's a process and, and by which that can be proven, um, that it was involuntary. Uh, and the other um, aspect of knowingly is there are, the way the language is crafted is it, it speaks about being impaired. Um, and um, your question to whether it could happen secondhand, 
and we addressed that as well in the sense that and none of the prosecutors I spoke with uh, have ever experienced um, a secondhand type of impairment. Uh, and especially with these types of products, you really have to be intentional about having that material up in your face to inhale it. Um, and it's practically impossible to have um, secondhand intoxication from those materials. Thank you, and, and thank you for that explanation. I was more, I, and I know knowingly, to me, we should never put it in, in any, any legislation, but I was thinking more going with the intent, that you mm -hmm. did it with the intent to get high, but uh, that's a good explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Grassl. Thank you, and I agree totally with this bill as well, but the knowingly part is also one of my concerns. Um, working working in, as a narcotics officer, we used to have to uh, strip a lot of uh, marijuana plants and get them ready for uh, get them ready for uh, BCA for analysis and so on. And every now and again, you, you'd feel a little bit, you know, not intentionally, but you'd feel a little bit loopy after you were, after you're done with your, with your job. So, you know, as, uh, as, uh, you know, not being one who, who smoked marijuana or ingested marijuana, but it had an adverse effect on me unintentionally. So it would be something if you're, if you're willing to uh, discuss this further. I know a lot of prosecutors, you know, you don't run into that a lot, but there are people that work in paint shops, auto body shops. Um, should they, should they uh, become impaired unintentionally? You know, that, th those are the types of things. So if, if, uh, if this can be a discussion that can be had later, you know, that'd be, that'd be great. Mr. Chair? A representative Wills. Uh, a couple other comments, and I appreciate that, Representative Grossel. Um My thought is that what you're describing wouldn't be to the level that this bill covers, that they would have to be impaired to the point where they wouldn't be able to function driving a vehicle or a boat and that sort of thing. Um, so feeling a little lightheaded, I think, is very different than what the bill addresses. Um, but it's a valid concern, so I appreciate you bringing that, bringing that up. And then another point um, as far as the knowingly um, is currently if someone is under the influence of alcohol, which is not addressed in this, this language, it's a separate section of statute, um, someone could say, well, I didn't know I was that drunk or I didn't know I had that much in my system, but yet we still prosecute because that much was in their system. Um, so. The, the word knowingly is not used in that situation or in those statutes, and I think it's fair um, to address it and treat it the same way here. Representative Uglum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to Representative Grossel's uh, concerns and things, um, I guess I would concur from the fact that, um, that uh, you, there's, there's a difference between overexposure in a paint shop or factory setting and things like that. And OSHA's guidelines uh, have, you know, uh, their, their threshold vo volume limits that, that you cannot exceed in things. And, and most uh, commercial companies and everything else are regulated by that. And they have air makeup systems and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> in my paint factories, occasionally I would have guys that would huff solvents you know, which is pretty easy to do in a paint factory. But, but uh, they really had to go at it uh, and, and all that. So you really have to intentionally try to get high. And, 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 you know, as far as incidental exposure, I think it is pretty rare. Thank you. Any, any public testimony on this bill? Mr. Chair. Representative Wills, any final I know comments? I had a few more testifiers on their way. I don't know if they're in the room yet. Perhaps not yet. Um, uh, is David Bernstein here yet? That's the last one we have on your list. I think so. <coughs> Mr. Chair. Representative Constantine. I would tell the author that I think she's got me convinced and I think we can go forward. I, I, I do as well. I've actually had a situation involving a crash 
with the with a synthetic <laughs> chemical that was not on the list at the time. And I am very thankful you're bringing this forward because this is a very ser serious situation that we do need to address. So thank you. Thank you. Any final comments? I'll have to let David know he shouldn't have been late. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee. I really appreciate your time and attention and your excellent questions. I think it, this is an issue that uh, needs to be addressed for our law enforcement and for our court system to be able to prosecute um, properly and effectively and to um, keep our roads safer. Uh, and uh, I know it's something that we don't want to do uh, lightly or uh, without making sure we're doing it correctly. So I really appreciate all of the stakeholders and, and all of the input that has gone into making sure um, that this is getting done correctly um, in, this, in this language. So I appreciate your support. Thank you. And with that, I'll renew my motion to lay over for possible inclusion into the omnibus. <laughs> uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two motions uh, that I'd like to make at this time. Should I proceed with that? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first motion relates to House File 1669. Members will remember that this is the bill which takes the same criminal background checks that are required for most sales of firearms and simply extends them to sales to all sales of firearms with reasonable exceptions such as to family members. This is a common sense step that's already used in other states. They have lower levels of domestic violence fatalities, lower levels of suicide by firearm, et cetera. And it's supported by the great majority of Minnesotans, of Republicans, and of gun owners who know that, yes, we can do more to keep firearms out of the hands of dangerous people, and at the same time, uphold the rights of those many responsible gun owners. We can do both. So when the bill was tabled a few weeks ago, the reason given at the time was the committee needed more time to review other bills on this topic. We have not heard any other such bills. And in those weeks since it was tabled, the momentum for criminal background checks has only grown. Um, support from law enforcement, the governor, more Republican legislators, thousands and thousands of young people. So members, today is the very last day that the committee can hear this bill and have it referred to other committees to make the legislative deadlines. So waited till the last day and actually the very end of the meeting on the last day. And so Mr. Chair and members, I am therefore moving to take House File 1669 back off the table so it can be debated and finally, more than a year after it was introduced, take just the next step in the legislative process. The many Minnesotans who support criminal background checks on sales uh, ask for your support for this motion. Okay. Members, this what? motion is not a debatable motion um, and I will ask for a roll call myself. Okay. And with that, we will take the roll. Johnson? No. Lomer? No. Hillstrom? Aye. Beckerfin? Aye. Considine? Yes. Dean? Aye. Frankie? Aye. Grossel? No. Howe? Nay. Lucero? No. Newberger? No. O'Neill? No. Pinto? Yes. Booglum? No. Ward? Yes. Zerwas? No. At uh, seven I nine nay, the bill does not. The motion does not pass. And Mr. Chair, members, then my second motion relates to House File 1605, which you recall allows family members or law enforcement to seek an extreme risk protection order. This is a court order keeping firearms away from a uh, uh, court order keeping firearms away from someone who has proven themselves to be a significant danger. And this is modeled on the same restraining order with the same due process protections that apply in domestic violence or harassment cases. I have an amended draft that I had circulated that incorporates ideas that were shared at the hearing and since. Um, and as with criminal background checks, this is a common sense step that's already in use in other states. It has for years and is working well. It's another way to keep gu help keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people at the same time uphold the rights of responsible gun owners. And again, just in the weeks since this bill was tabled, the momentum for extreme risk protection orders has grown. The Republican legislature and governor in Florida have adopted these orders. The Trump administration has called on every state to adopt extreme risk protection orders. The NRA has called on Congress to support states to enact 
extremist protection orders. And the U.S. Department of Justice, Attorney General Sessions, have offered to states to help them in setting up these orders. As with criminal background checks, this bill was introduced more than a year ago, and today again is the very last day, we're in the last minutes, that the committee can hear it and have it referred to other committees to make legislative deadlines. And so, Mr. Chair and members, I'm moving to take this bill as well back off the table so it can be debated and finally take the next step in the legislative process. Minnesotans want us to join the rest of the country in adopting this common sense approach to help keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. Okay, members, again, this motion is not a debatable motion. And I also, again, will request a roll call on this motion. And at this time, we will take the roll. Johnson? No. Lomer? No. Hillstrom? Aye. Beckerfin? Aye. Constantine? Aye. Dean? Aye. Frankie? No. Grossel? No. Howe? Nay. Lucero? No. Newberger? No. O'Neill? No. Pinto? Yes. Uglum? No. Ward? Zerwas. No. Okay, members, at uh, six ayes, ten nays, the motion does not pass. Representative Constantine. Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Constantine. Vote them out. 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 Oh, this meeting is a dream. Vote them out. God. <laughs>